Did you know that your emotions could actually be damaging your heart and you wouldn't even know it until it's too late? Emily says her motto is that a good time is earned after everything on her multiple to-do list have been completed to perfection. But was the stress of that lifestyle the cause of her recent heart attack? Take a look. When it comes to me, I believe I have a type A personality. Getting things done, I always seem to have a list for everything. Grocery list, work list, long-term list, daily list. My desk for work must be organized. Everything is organized. Pantry, closet. I'm an architect. I will drop anything to meet my clients' needs. If I'm trying to relax or going for a walk and they need something, it often means late nights and weekend work. About a year ago, I was under an enormous amount of stress and a lot of long hours. In my personal life, I had extra stress because I was preparing for a dinner party. I went to the dryer to pull out some clean linens, and when I opened the dryer door, I found my little baby kitten, Rufus. Lifeless, he was dead. I was struck with so much guilt and grief. I was absolutely beside myself. I was so upset, I began having chest pains. I went to the emergency room. What I found out was I had a stress-induced heart attack. I was in the hospital for about two days and then I was released and went back home and straight back to work. I was back on the phone making work calls and within minutes, the pain returned. It, it was even worse. I went back to the emergency room. It was like, I can't believe this is happening to me again. I was in the hospital for another three days. The doctor was very clear with me that I needed to reduce my stress or I would end up back in the hospital. So I don't even know where to start and where to begin. The concept of stress reduction seems so foreign to me that it's actually stressing me out even thinking about it. Okay, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm all right. Yeah. It's a lot of stress. Yes, I bet it is. Stress for being here, stress for not being there taking time for yourself. That's not easy for you. It is not. Okay. Well, let me tell you how seriously I take this on your behalf. Okay. My intention today is that you're going to change some things in your life so you don't die. What did you hear me say? Change things in my life so I don't die. Yeah. Does that land on you? so you don't die. Oh, I understand how serious this is. I'm a type A type person, so I get you. I mean, I, I really get your commitment and wanting to do things and how buttoned up you are and committed to your, your profession you are and all of that. But I also know what I think you deserve. And I don't intend for you to leave here without having that same vision of what you deserve. What I deserve is an interesting concept of... Foreign. I would, yes. Yeah. You say that you'll sleep when you're dead. That's not a really great motto anymore. <laughs> yeah. just... And you're really proud that you can sit at your desk for eight hours and only take one bathroom break. You, you sold your on, right? I, I'm very efficient. Can you relax? I'm trying. I'm trying new things. It's difficult when you, I mean, a lot of my relaxation things usually involve being competitive or it's just kind of reevaluating the whole life. Of No, that's activities okay. that distract. Can you relax, relax? Stand up. Okay. Okay. Can you, can you be tense? Yes. You got that? Yeah. Okay, just turn this way, face here. Okay, I want you to put both arms out to your side, and I want you to make a fist just as tight as you can. Okay, and I want you to hold that, and then I'm going to count to three, and then I want you to just completely relax your arms. All right, one, two, three. Okay, that's okay. That's relaxation. No, <laughs> I mean it's better than it was before. My point is, you don't know what relaxation is. I think that's a fair point. Okay, because I'm going to do this, and you, you count for me, and then I'll relax on okay. three. One, two, three. Okay. Okay, lift my arm up. <laughs> okay. Now, when I lift yours up, 
Squeeze. On three, we're going to relax, and you're going to drop it like it's 500 pounds. One, two, three. There you go. Okay. That's an absence of tension, okay? That feels foreign. It does feel foreign. I bet you haven't ever felt that before. Now, if you can get to that point where you could have that throughout your body two or three times a day, do you think it would make a difference in your life? Yes. I mean, I, I looked at everything, and uh, here, here's a picture of your desk. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it and I thought, this woman must have been potty trained at gunpoint. <laughs> uh, oh, it's something that um, I knew it was all my mom's fault. <laughs> yeah. Now, we went in your pantry with the camera, right? Uh -huh. You took pictures for us. Let's take a look at this. Um, do you see anything out of order there? I do. What? The uh, label on one of them should have been turned. You guys turned that, didn't you? <laughs> it didn't take you a quarter of a second. <laughs> yeah, you you feel like you need to race home and... I'll call someone after this. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, I think I've made my point. Uh, next, Emily's best friend worries because the word chill and relax are not near vocabulary, and I just demonstrated that physiologically as well as mentally. He says he's concerned she will never change her perfectionistic personality. We're going to add him to the conversation after the break. Emily and I are best friends. When it comes to Emily, everything needs to be perfect. Everything. Emily has a lot of hobbies. French needlepoint, her millinery work. She's also a great artist. She puts a lot of pressure on herself to maintain this level of perfection. I'm not surprised Emily had a stress-related heart attack. She's been going 100% all these years, and it was bound to catch up to her. I'm really concerned. I want her to listen to professionals, take it to heart, and take care of herself before it's too late. From her meticulous crafts to perfectly planning everything to a T, Emily's best friend Jeff says he worries she will never be able to de-stress her life. Now, also joining us is my good friend and someone I have tremendous respect for, Dr. John White, he's the chief medical officer of WebMD. You all know WebMD, right? He has written a new book called Take Control of Your Heart Disease Risk. Now, you, when you read this book, you would think that he had written this for you, that he sat down and said, okay, I'm going to write her a personal book, a personal journal. And this tackles how mental health and the heart are inextricably intertwined, plus a whole lot more. So please give a warm welcome to my good friend, Dr. John White. <laughs> uh, doctor, thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me, Dr. Phil. When we talk about heart and such things as stress, anxiety, depression, they are so closely linked and that has had a tremendous impact here. And of course, Emily knows that now and her doctors have told her, told her that, but that's true with everybody, correct? Absolutely. And I'm not sure how much the doctors really have told you because as we've talked about, many doctors don't focus on the role of our emotions, the role of our stress and how it really impacts the heart. Jeff, you say you weren't surprised when she had a stress-related heart attack because you see how tightly wound she is. She's been like this ever since I've known her, which is almost 25 years. She's yeah. tightly wound. Um, she can have fun, but I don't know if she's relaxing. And it's, it's wearing you out. You're wanting to be perfectionistic. And in fact, you're out of control, not in control because you're not paddling your own canoe. You're just responding to what everybody, you know, phone rings, you answer it, get it done. Phone rings, answer it, get it done. Phone rings, answer it, get it done. Instead of being the captain of your own ship here. And if you were truly in control, you would have a balance of health, recreation, work, stress, achievement, 
all of those things. And that's what you're going to have to have for longevity. And you can have that. And you can, you can reset your stress levels throughout the day, true? Absolutely. It takes work, but you can do it. And if it's somebody that's buttoned up like she is, you just work it into the schedule. And that might be something that, that works for you, to actually scheduling time where you can enjoy yourself and focus on that self-care. If you take a few times through the day, like every two or three hours, and you do some things that efficiently de-stress yourself, it's like you know the cup fills up with stress and you take even five minutes to empty that cup of stress, it will take hours to fill back up and then you empty it again. Your efficiency, the efficiencies with which you discharge your responsibilities, do your work, will go up as much as 30 or 40 percent. Now you're talking. You talk about take control of your heart disease risk. And a big part of that is recognizing that your emotions and your stress do interact with your heart, even to the point of changing its anatomy. That's right. And there is no physical health without mental health. And we don't focus enough on that. And, and what's happening with this chronic stress that you're having is it's causing these release of norepinephrine and epinephrine. And in the short term, that's good. But in the long term, it's clamping down on your blood vessels. It's increasing blood pressure. It's decreasing blood flow to the heart and vital organs. And that's what's causing those symptoms of chest pain and a heart attack that you're having. There's a physiologic reason why stress damages the heart. I bet if we measured something called C-reactive protein, which you know is a measure of chronic inflammation, I bet yours would be pretty high. And inflammation in the short term is good if you damage your foot, but long term inflammation is going to damage your cells and actually increase plaque in your blood vessels, and that increases your heart disease risk. Yeah, I was thinking about this a couple of nights ago, and, and this just came to me. I, I, I envision you know, your headstone. Here lies Emily. She wasn't lazy. Uh, you know, you don't want that on your headstone. Or here lies Emily, too busy to rest in peace. Or here lies Emily, no time to live, but plenty of time to die. You don't want these on your headstone. My dad would be really proud of the not lazy one, though. I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, he would be a lot more proud for you to come over and spend some time That's with him. True. That's what he would really be proud of. And that's what you want. I'm a dad, so I know that. And when you say that really got you, what do you mean? I think this um, entire situation has really made me question my mortality. And about, sorry, I think I'm going to need that. <laughs> no, it's all right. Go ahead. Just talk through the tears. It's okay. Um, you question your mortality, what's important to you, prioritize. Time with my dad would be up there. Yeah. And it's a gift to him for you to take care of you. And I want you to listen as we continue talking. We're, we're going to talk to a, 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 another situation, and this is a father whose cardiac issues arose after the tragic death of his five-year-old son. Now, could his grief and sadness have caused his heart to literally break? Well, we're going to meet him and his wife next. And I want you to listen to everything that we say before we finish. We'll be right back. A horrible scene on Monday Night Football as a player for the Buffalo Bills collapsed during the game. Safety of DeMar Hamlin is in critical condition and was given CPR on the field. DeMar Hamlin, we are hearing him speak for the first time since he collapsed from a cardiac arrest during the game. Hamlin posted a video on social media over the weekend thanking the medical staff who saved his life and the people who have been rooting for his recovery. It's just been a lot to process, but I can't tell you how 
appreciative I am of all the love, all the support, and everything that's just been coming in my way. Buffalo Bills football player Damar Hamlin's on-the-field cardiac event was not only an amazing story of survival, it also put heart health at the forefront of conversations right now. Now, parents Tyler and Megan's son Maddox battled a congenital heart defect from the time he was born, resulting in a successful heart transplant at just 17 months old. But on May 19th, the unthinkable happened. Our son Maddox was very special to us. He was the light of our life. Everything excited him. Maddox loved to wake up in the morning and tell me, Mama, it's daytime. He was excited to start his day every day. About a year ago, everything changed suddenly. Maddox woke up not feeling well. We noticed his color was very pale and bluish. We called 911 immediately. On the way to the hospital, he ended up flatlining. His last words to me were, Mama, I don't want to go. We watched the team of people each take turns trying to resuscitate him. It was like an out-of-body experience. I just wanted him to come back. They were performing CPR on Maddox for about 45 minutes, but nothing ended up working. I just asked them to stop the CPR and allow us to hold Maddox. One day, Maddox was just fine, and the next day, he was just gone. Tyler says that his depression and heartache over losing his little boy may have caused him to have his own heart issues. Losing a child is the worst pain in the world. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. When Maddox passed away, I felt like a part of me died with him. I haven't been the same person. It's affected every aspect of his life, his work, his sleeping, pretty much need of your day-to-day -day activities. What runs through my mind is I may have failed my son. I had one job and he's not here anymore, so I failed that job. There have been times I didn't want to be here anymore. I felt I needed to be with him. In the past year, I've fallen into a deep depression. Every day is hard to the point where I just feel like I'm a zombie to get through it. Numb with no emotion. Feels like Tyler's spark is gone. Like his fire's been put out. I feel like my sadness and what I've been through has definitely affected my own personal health. The doctors discovered that my left ventricle of my heart is also enlarged. At this point, I'm just scared. I've been having a lot of chest pains. I feel pain sometimes in my back, my shoulder blade area. My hands been tingly and numb. I feel like a lot of times I'm living inside of a nightmare that, that won't stop. Well, Megan, Tyler, it's, it's good to meet you both. And nice to meet you. Terrible circumstance. Uh, uh, one thing you will not hear me say today is I know how you feel. I don't want you to. I, I, I don't want to know how you feel, and it would be stupid for me to presume that I do. I'm so sorry uh, that you're having to go through this. And uh, you said something, Tyler, that um, I had a hard time listening to, actually. You, you said that um, you, you feel like you failed him, that you had one job, and and he's gone. Tell me about that. I'm dad. I'm supposed to be his protector, just like my other boys. And I, I do. I feel like I failed him. Everyone says not to blame yourself, but, but he's gone. He's not here. What would you do different if you had it to do over again? Nothing. I did the best I could. We did the best we could. There was, there's nothing... We, we could have really done. Could either of you have loved him any more? Probably not. I mean, he was Megan? the light of my world. I mean, could, could you, could you have, could you have loved him any harder? Could you have uh, prayed any harder, loved him any harder, cared any more? deeply than, than what you did. I loved him with my whole heart. And I like to think of him as just pure love himself. He made it a point to make everyone in his world feel very special and love. 
you want to say there's things we could have done different, you know? I, we feel guilt. We feel... Uh, but there's when we, when we're told, when we think about it, there's nothing else. Absolutely. There's, there's nothing else. I look at everything that, you know, we've heard the story. I, I look at the, the joy in his eyes and his heart and the way he... I mean, look at him hanging on to you and and the pictures with you. I mean, this was a force of, of joy and, and love and delight uh, that was in this world. And um, he knew nothing but that, thanks to the two of you. That was his trip through this world. I and mean, God bless you for being his parents. Uh, he won the parent lottery. I won uh, the lottery with him. Yes, and then it works, it, it works two ways. And, and and so now, you know, not even God can change what has happened. And, you know, I, I've been talking to Dr. White about it. And I, you know, on page 39 of this book is chapter four, which is depression. And look, you're not ever going to get over this loss. Not ever, ever, ever when you get over this loss. What you'll do is you'll get through it. You'll find a way to fold it into your consciousness, fold it into your being, and hopefully you'll get through it to the point that when you think of him, you're filled with joy for who he was and what you had instead of the pain that you experience from the loss. Dr. White, when you have prolonged depression, then you can actually die from a broken heart. You, it changes your heart, and, and it can be, we'll talk about that. Because you, you talk about in Chapter 4, of take control of your heart disease risk. And there's something called Takutsobu cardiomyopathy that you and I have talked about. That's uh, the Japanese named it after a uh, fishing pot that's used to catch octopus. And it rounds out a bowl with a narrow opening. And that's what likely happened with your heart as well, that it increased that size of your left ventricle mm -hmm. and it didn't allow it to pump well. So you're not getting oxygenated blood to the rest of your body. And it, it's just the surge of emotions that literally is changing the way your heart functions and the way that it's shaped. And Maddox was not an only child. No. You have how many? Five boys, including Maddox. So you have four boys at home. Yes. And those four boys need their mother and their father. I mean, look at what a beautiful family. Thank you. Congratulations to y'all for having such a beautiful family. They need their mother and father. And by the way, they don't need part of them they need all of them, including the memory of, of Maddox. They need you to talk about him, and they, you don't need to hide crying in front of them. They need, it's okay for them to see that. It's okay for you to talk about it. Uh, but they don't need you to be a martyr on Maddox's behalf. They don't need you to join Maddox they need you to stay with them. They need a daddy. They need a father and a mother and a daddy and a, and a mommy. That's what they need. And as, as Dr. White says, you have to make choices that protect you. Uh, Megan says since the loss of, of Maddox, she has been rushed to the ER multiple times for chest pain, but all of her tests have come back clean. We'll talk about that after the break. About a year before Maddox passed, uh, my grandfather moved in with us. My wife, Megan, and I became his caregiver. Grandpa and Maddox were extremely close. Maddox would run in and sneak ice creams to Grandpa. Anytime we'd come home from being gone as we'd come in, and Maddox would, first thing he would do, Grandpa, we're home. When Maddox passed away, Grandpa was completely devastated. A week after Maddox passed, Grandpa walked out of his room and 
collapsed. Immediately we called 911. We were doing CPR with them. Yeah, the ambulance got here and rushed them to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, the doctor told us that grandpa had passed. I believe my grandfather died of a broken heart. Well, I have Dr. John White here today. He's Chief Medical Officer of WebMD, and he's written a book called Take Control of Your Heart Disease Risk. And we're talking about something that doctors don't talk about very often because, frankly, it's complex and it takes time, and that's how mental health impacts your heart. And Megan says, just like her husband Tyler, she's been struggling with her emotions, of course, uh, and having heart issues since losing their son Maddox. At this point, I'm really concerned for my wife, Megan. With all the stress of losing our five-year-old son, Maddox, I've been struggling with anxiety and depression, panic attacks. I've been having really bad chest pains, sometimes unbearable. My heart races. I just have this constant pain in my chest, and it just feels so heavy. My chest pains have been so bad, I've gone to the emergency room a couple times. But the crazy thing is the EKG doesn't show anything wrong. I feel like no one understands what it feels like to go through this grief. I just pray one day I can feel normal again, but I don't know when or if that can happen. I don't even think it's possible. Megan, I think you're right. Um, normal is in your rearview mirror because of what you two have been through. You, you're not ever going to feel the way you did before these losses that you've been through, certainly the, the Maddox loss. So that means that part of your life is what you call normal is gone. So that means you have to create a new normal. And that new normal is with Maddox as a memory, Maddox as a relationship that you you have that's spiritual, not physical, that you commit to keeping alive by talking about him and having pictures and talking about him at holidays and Christmas and around the table and making sure that the children never forget him and all, all of those things. It's a new normal. We got to be there for our kids. It's, right. There's no other option. You've got to find a way, and you've got to take care of yourself, and you've got to take care of yourself. And that can be done, right? But you, to do that, you've got to manage the emotions. That's right, and self-care is probably the last thing that you want to talk about right now, to take care of yourself. And people forget that 12% of first heart attacks are fatal. People don't survive. So if you don't start trying to address the issues of depression and anxiety, that's going to increase your risk. One of the things that depression does that people don't talk enough about is it actually changes the way our platelets work. And platelets are, are good because they help with clotting, right? But when they clot at the wrong time, that's when people have a heart attack. And, and that's what I'm concerned about, the risk that you're having for yourselves because you want to be around for your children. But if you don't start to take care of yourself, it's going to add up over time, as you and I have talked often about. It's those daily choices over time. Sometimes parents don't want to cry in front of their children. And what Dr. White is saying is it's actually cathartic to cry, to let that out. You hardly ever see anybody have a heart attack crying. You know, it's because that's cathartic. That's letting the stress out. That's letting it go. Um, it's, it's when you try to stuff it down and keep it all inside, and you don't want to do that. You don't need to do that, and you want to role model for your kids. I don't think we necessarily have a problem with letting it out. It's when does the pain go away, you know? It transforms, and it doesn't, it doesn't go away. It, it transforms the memories transform and there was such joy in this young boy that you just simply can't look at that face and you, you can't look at that face time and time again and not 
find a smile. I close my eyes and I picture him and I see a smile and I could be almost not breathing and hurts so bad. And when I see a smile when my eyes are closed, I, it's like almost like the arm dropping. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can feel it kind of release. Yeah, it, just, it releases out of you. Do you believe that he's able to look down and see what's going on here? I believe he had a big part in all this. Yeah. I had a clergyman share a story with me about this one time and because it just makes no sense why God would take children like Maddox. No, it doesn't. It, it just it doesn't make any sense. And he was relating the, how you know, every, every day in, in, in heaven all the children would gather around God and they would all light a candle and go walking and there was always one little boy that would sit to the side and never go on the walk and they asked him why won't you go walking with all of us and he said well I can't and they said why and he said well every time I light my candle my parents tears put it out and I believe it until they find a way for me to be a source of joy I, I can't join in and you'll get there you'll I'm afraid get there. to get there too at the same time though but that doesn't mean you're letting him go it doesn't mean you're betraying his memory it doesn't mean that you're letting him go it just means that he's no longer a source of pain for you. And the sooner you get there in your own time, in your own way, you'll be a blessing to your, to your four boys. And they deserve both of you. Next, Dr. White is going to demonstrate how to perform hands-only CPR on an adult or teen because you never know when you just might need to save someone you love. That's after. All this hour, we've been talking about the undeniable connection between physical and mental health and how certain emotions like anger, stress, depression, loneliness, and anxiety can actually cause biochemical changes that can translate to physiologic alterations in our hearts. That's why I've teamed up with Dr. John White, the Chief Medical Officer of WebMD, for an exclusive series of columns in USA Today to discuss this very important issue and many others concerning your health, both mental and physical. The stakes couldn't be higher. So please tell your friends, family, and everyone you know to scan the flow code on the screen. Just open the camera on your smartphone, aim it at the Dr. Phil Diamond, and click the link that pops up to see our article in USA Today. Before the break, I said that Dr. White was going to demonstrate do's and don'ts of performing hands-only CPR on a teen and adult. Uh, so, Dr. White, show us how this um, should go. Okay, so here we have a mannequin that I'm going to demonstrate on. So, um, what the American Heart Association wants you to know is that if you witness either a teen or adult suddenly collapse, you focus on two things. The first is to call 911. That's really important. That's the first thing that you do to get help on its way. Either you do it or, or have someone else do it and then perhaps keep it on a speakerphone. And then the second, as Dr. Phil mentioned, is to do hands-only CPR. And the key is that you want to do it fast and that you want to do it hard. So I'm going to uh, get down next to the mannequin, and this would be the person, and you'd want them on ideally a hard, flat surface, so you don't want them on a bed. And what you're going to do is you're going to put the palm base of your hand right below the sternum, and then you clasp your hands together. You're going to need to compress about two inches down, and that is uh, a bit deeper than most people think. 
And that's key. You really have to push down those two inches to have compression. And then you want to feel a recoil, the chest wall come back up. And the key is to do this about 100 to 120 times per minute. So it's a pretty fast pace that you're doing it. And you're doing that until help arrives. Dr. Phil, if you see someone collapse, time really is of the essence, and you need to get oxygenated blood to the rest of the body after you call 911. Okay. But, uh, yeah. And they survive. Yeah. So. I, I want to thank all of my guests today, and a very special thanks to Dr. John White. Um, his book, uh, Take Control of Your Heart Disease Risk, is available now wherever books are sold. And everyone in the audience is going home with a copy uh, from Dr. White. Now, uh, before the audience leaves today, we reached out to the American Heart Association, and they sent their community CPR managers here today to demonstrate hands-on CPR for the audience to give all of you an opportunity to practice chest compressions. Uh, to watch that and for more information about today's episode, or if you'd like to share your story, log on to drphil.com. We'll be discussing all of this on my social platforms so you know where to find me. Be safe, and uh, we will see you next time. Thanks for being here today. the heel of your hand. That's right, correct. It's not your arms that you're using, it's your it's your entire body weight. Yep, faster. All of your energies will be on the heel. Oh, yep, put straight down, there we go. Arms straight, keep it as straight as you can, arms straight and then push hard and fast. There you go. Yeah, just like that, perfect. There you go, yep. It's a good way, okay. good. That's really good. <laughs>
today on Dr. Phil. My husband threw me away like a piece of trash. Did you have a girlfriend? Yes. He had a midlife crisis. What happened? You just wake up stupid one morning? So she had one too. This man, when I met him, my legs buckled. Did you spend the weekend with him? I spent the week with him. Well, plot thickens. Her husband was ready to call it quits. When he asked me for a divorce, I told him he needed to get his testosterone levels checked. I just thought, you know, maybe he's dipping. You know, women dip, they go up and down and they dip. And I thought maybe Danny was dipping. Now he wants her back. You want to put this back together, even though you blew it up. Yes. Yeah. She took up with another man, and instantly, your midlife crisis was over. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. I hate to see people suffering, and you've heard long enough. Stand by, Dr. Phil. Wilson, take I'm going to get you the help that you need. In five, four, This is going to be a changing day in your life. Go, Dr. Phil. guess Judy says that she had the perfect husband for the first 30 years of marriage. They shared date nights, vacations, weekends, camping, and trips to Disney World with her precious daughter. Judy says her husband was her soulmate and he was her best friend. And Danny agrees. He says, look, it was a true fairy tale marriage until last year when he says he turned into a complete monster. That's what he says. Now he's here to find out if the damage he's done to his relationship can ever be repaired. Take a look. My marriage was a wonderful marriage. Every marriage has its ups and downs. We didn't have very many downs. Judy and I had a picture-perfect marriage. I believe we were made for each other. In my mind, I thought things started to change when his father passed away. Last year, when I turned 53, I felt like I was at the end of my life, and you just want to live every day like it's your last day. I didn't know what was going on with my husband. He started not coming home from work until later in the evening. I said, why would you not come home after you're working 12 hours? When I had the midlife crisis mindset, just breaking the normal routine was a sense of freedom for me, wanting to do what I wanted when I wanted to do it for as long as I wanted to do it. I would try my best to shake his being. I love you, why are you doing this? And it didn't rock it. I said, you're like an ice man. You're so cold and distant. Are you in there? And then he started getting angry. Just really didn't want anybody to question me for what I was doing or where I had been. Normal things in life would make me angry. Always had a lot of questions in my head swirling around like a tornado. He would always go downstairs and make coffee and donuts, and he would bring it up to me before he went to work. And he kissed me goodbye, I love you, baby, have a good day, and off he would go. That evening, he came home. He says, Judy, I want to tell you something. I want a divorce. I don't want to be the perfect husband. I just want to live a single life. But everything's going to be OK. And he laughed at me. I said, what is wrong with you? And that's when it started to fall apart. I did tell her I wanted a divorce, but I cannot remember anything about that day. It is a blur. There were no real signs. I just thought my husband was being challenged with mourning the death of his father. After I asked Judy for a divorce, I stayed five more months before I actually moved out. Danny had become very secretive. I hired a private investigator because I thought my husband was mentally ill. The private investigator told me that a woman had stayed the night at Danny's house. When Judy questioned me about the other woman, I did lie to her. He was furious. He was so upset, he pulled out of the driveway cussing me. Danny never cussed me. And that's when it really started going bad. Well, Judy says when she found out that Danny was having an affair, she raged in a way she never thought she was capable of. Judy came to the house, knocked on the door. I didn't let her come in because there was someone else there. I thought it was odd he wasn't answering the door, but his truck was there. I went into Danny's truck and retrieved his cell phone. I started reading all these tech messages from the girl he was seeing. Love you, Tiger. Gonna be blonde tonight. I'm scared. You gonna hurt me? I was standing there reading these messages, and Danny walked over to me and grabbed my arm, and something in me just let loose. I just took my fist and beat my husband in his head. She did hit me quite a few times upside the head and in the face. 
I got back in the car and I left and went to a parking place and just cried and screamed. I called three people to let them know that if I go to jail, please come bail me out because my husband will probably press charges against me. Okay, I know why he's here. You want to put this back together? Absolutely. No question about no, it? No you, question. Whatever it takes, you want to put this back whatever together? Whatever it takes. Uh, even though you blew it up? Yes. Okay. Why are you here? I need help. I look at him, and I, my heart loves him, but I'm so mad at him. I don't know if this can be fixed. Well, other than the day you whopped him up beside the head several times, have you told him how you feel? Absolutely, I have. Uh-huh. Absolutely, I have told him. I've told him, you what know. What have you told him? I've told him, how could you do this? We have a beautiful family. You know, your actions destroyed everything that we have lived for. You know, the woman, just everything that he has done. And I'm thinking, how can the love of my life just throw me away like a piece of trash and not look back? He had no emotion. He was not sincere. He didn't love me. He was just so angry. So I don't know. I don't know if this is a marriage that can be repaired. So I'm here to ask you for some guidance, some teaching tools. Uh, you wrote me an email at one point that was lengthy and thoughtful, and you had no question that you wanted to fix this. At that time, I had no question. Okay, at that I, time. I was still loving my husband, yes. Right. And, uh, and it, like I say, it was lengthy and thoughtful. I mean, you were very introspective. You, you talked about your feelings, what you wanted to do. Uh, we've heard from you as well. So why did you do this? What happened? Did you just wake up stupid one morning? What? Uh, what pretty happened? much, yes. Because that, that, uh, that's how you describe it, right? You said, uh, I, I don't know. I just... This, it, this, that feeling and mindset consumed me fairly quickly. Um, and I had no idea what, what the definition of a midlife crisis was at that time. Well, what is that? What, you said you didn't know what midlife crisis was. Um, I still don't know what that means. I hear you hear it a lot. You see it a lot. But what what is that? Uh, after the fact, after I'd read a lot of stuff she had put on the on the computer, it, it's def, it's the, it's a life changing events like getting out of a routine or a schedule, uh, doing things you normally would not do, uh, things of that nature, and that just pretty much described me A to Z the, the symptoms that I had. I have every card that he's ever given me, 33 years worth. I left him a Valentine's card on the counter, telling well, him that I still loved him. He threw it away in the trash. And later, she took up with another man, and instantly, your midlife crisis was over. Well, we posted a poll on Facebook asking, do you believe that men can really have a midlife crisis? Almost 90% of you said yes, and 11% said no. So most people, and you would certainly vote yes. Yes. At that point, you just, you, you said you wanted to live every day like it was your last. That's the <clears throat> feeling that you get. Yes. You, you felt a rush, like you had to, you had to do something today. Adrenaline. Uh, even when you were tired, you still had adrenaline. Uh, that, that was one of the reasons for not coming home right after work. Uh, just didn't want to end the day. You had said there wasn't enough time in the day. Not enough time in the, the day. The days weren't long enough, you said. Right. Well, they were, but they were long enough to get a mistress, and yours were long enough to get a PI. Yes. So that that did eventually come. Yes. Right. Now. You left her a note. Mm -hmm. I, I have the note here, this note. Tell me about this note. At that point, I had begged my husband, threw myself at him, trying to save the marriage. And I come home one day, and there was this note that basically said to me, move on, move on with your life. Find a friend, find a boyfriend. Be happy, because I am. I'm moving on. Yeah. Well, I, I have the note. Um, it, it, it was interesting. I mean, you said, at one point, you said, quote, I'm moving on with my life. I don't need your permission. 
I will do the divorce with or without your he permission. He did say that. I suggest you move forward. Find a friend or whatever. Protect yourself and be careful. In other words, he was giving me, in his mind, he was giving me the right to move on in my life, to find either a partner in life, because he didn't want any parts of that <clears throat> anymore. Right. Um, did you have a girlfriend at that point? I don't, well, I'm not sure exactly the time that that letter was written. You did. Uh, it was on... I do remember was writing it, but not Four days after Valentine's Day. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. This year. I did. Yes. Yeah. Four days after. That was probably the Valentine's beginning. Day. I know, because I left him a Valentine's card on the counter telling well, him that I still loved him. Yeah, I did. So you remember that? I do. Um, he threw it away in the trash. He did. It was hard. I have every card that he's ever given me. 33 years worth. Yeah. And he threw yours in the trash. He didn't want it. He wanted no parts of it. I didn't get any flowers or box of candy or a card because he always said in his cards, I love you, baby. You're my world. You know, so I didn't get that. That was just the beginning of the mess, the nightmare. Danny can't remember a lot of things that he did to me. That's what's so scary about this. He can't remember his temperaments. He can't remember how he treated me. You know, and that's what was scary because I thought there was something mentally wrong with him. Maybe there is. Well, that's why I hired a private investigator. I thought the private investigator was going to tell me that my husband is mentally ill, that he's depressed, and all he's doing is going to work. I knew he was going to tell me that. Well, a lot of times we use doctors for that. Well, I had taken him. You know, it's funny you say that because when he asked me for a divorce, I told him he needed to get his testosterone levels checked. I just thought, you know, maybe he's dipping. You know, women dip. They go up and down and they dip. And I thought maybe Danny was dipping. I didn't know that a man could dip. <laughs> but he did. He was dipping. And I thought, well, we're going to find out. So I took him to his family park, you know, the family physician. Yes. And he, they did blood work. And that day, I told the doctor, I said, there's something wrong with my husband. There's something wrong with him. He's dipping. Can't you help him? <laughs> you know? And she said, well, his blood tests come back OK. Everything's OK. And that's when I told her that there was something terribly wrong with this man. Yeah. Because you don't stay married 31 years and live the beautiful life that we had. And all of a sudden, he's just ready to toss it in the trash and walk away from everything. His daughter, his grandchildren, me, his partner in life. This man worshipped the ground I walked on. He held my hand yes. 33 years. A night never went by that that man didn't kiss me when he went to bed. We went to bed at the same time. We took baths together every night. <laughs> you don't do that. We did. You know, how many people can say they take a bath with their husband every night? Probably, uh, <laughs> we probably had a connection. Certainly not my wife. Uh, well. <laughs> it, it, I haven't had a bath in 40 years. Take a, <laughs> take a crane to get we, me uh, out of there. We probably had a connection a few couples have. Yeah. We, we yeah, our connection that we had, I, I don't know of too many people that have it. It's like, you know, they wonder if we're both sick. I don't know. Uh, and that, that comes to the point that I, I don't understand how it happened either. This, this Well, let, we're going to talk about that. Let, okay. let's, let's take a break here. Uh, Judy took the note to heart. She did. He said, you need to find yourself a friend. She did. <laughs> and is now caught between two lovers. We'll drive back. <laughs> I met a gentleman. It was a total instant attraction. When Danny found out that I was away with a man, he was going to drive to Dip Me and make me come home. I'm on vacation with another man because my husband threw me away like a piece of trash. Well, Danny says his midlife crisis hit at age 53, and in an instant, he decided to end his 30 year long, too good to be true marriage to Judy. Now, after 10 devastating months, Judy says, she just, look, she said, I got to start my life again. So she joined a dating website and met a man who she says she cannot stop thinking about. 
I decided after 10 months that I needed to move forward with my life. I knew that he was not coming back, that he didn't want me. I was sitting on my couch Sunday evening, and I was on Match.com, and I decided to join. Judy signed on to an online dating site and did tell me how many hits she got. The purpose behind that was to try and make me jealous. I met a gentleman on Match.com. We had a phone conversation, and he did want to meet me. I walked up to him, embraced him, and I had not felt that way for a long time. It was a total instant attraction. My knees buckled when he grabbed me. This man changed everything. That first date was a wonderful week of my life. He took me away on vacation, and we just enjoyed each other's company. I came over to the house. Judy had left me a note on the counter that she had met someone and had gone away for the weekend. Something woke up inside of him, and he realized that his wife was no longer there. I did call her, crying to her on the phone, asking her to come back home to forgive me and telling her that I wanted her back in my life. When Danny found out that I was away with a man, he was going to drive to get me and make me come home. He was calling my family, he was calling me, and it got to the point where Lawrence told me to turn the phone off. I'm on vacation with another man because my husband threw me away like a piece of trash. He didn't want me anymore. Well, plot thickens. Um, so that was a big step for you to it go on a, a dating very, website. It was. Because like you said, 33 years together, 30 years of marriage, uh, then all of a sudden you're with a stranger. I had been waiting for 10 months, and it was to the point where I just could not do it anymore. I thought I had waited long enough. This man showed no emotion. He, sh he showed me that he wasn't going to come home. So when I decided to go on that website and go on a date, which is something I had not hardly ever done in my life because I'd been with Danny, it was something new and exciting. And this man, when I met this man, he was genuine. Mm. And I had, we met, and I, I actually, the day we met, that day he threw his driver's license up on the table. He said, take a picture of this, send it to your mother, your brother, your sister, I'm taking you away. And I said, no, you're not. We went to dinner, had a really long dinner. That evening, he says, so you're going to go away with me? I said, yeah, what time are you picking me up? <laughs> and he took me away. We had a beautiful time. And I immediate, immediately, this man just grabbed hold of my heart. I never wanted another man to touch me. I never wanted another man. I never wanted anybody else but Danny. Mm -hmm. You know, he's I wasn't all I gone wanted. Ten months either. Well, it was it was almost it it, it I was. I didn't move out until February. I know, but you asked yeah. for the divorce I mean, in September. I was emotionally not Listen, there. I'm, I'm gonna try to help you here, but okay. this ain't about the math, okay? <laughs> this is not about calendar math. Um, it sent like ten years to me. It might have been two months, but it was ten months. Okay, was this the first man that you met? when you went on the dating site? No, I met one other gentleman for lunch. We had a, a, a lunch date and... Um, Didn't click? No, because it wasn't anything I was looking for. It wasn't, I wasn't looking for a husband or a lover or... I was looking to get out of the house to find a friendship. Well, was, you know, what was the difference between the first guy you met for lunch and the second guy you went away with? Well, the second guy I went away with, when I met him, my legs buckled. I just... <laughs> he grabbed the hold of me. He grabbed a hold of me when I got out of the car at the racetrack, and he just grabbed a hold of me and says, come on, girl, we're going to go in here and talk. And we spent the whole afternoon into the evening together. And, it, and it, I felt so safe. It, it, I just, it was a feeling I would not had for a very long time. Yeah. I mean, your legs just don't buckle when you meet people. No. No, and I work around a lot of men, professional people. Yeah. So this is not anything that is normal. This was normal. the first buckle. Absolutely, it was. Yeah. <laughs> it was. Yeah. In two ways? Yes. I mean, did, did you spend the weekend with him? I spent the week with him. The week? I did. Yeah. And Danny, he, um, when he found that letter, because I asked him to watch the house. Nobody knew that I was going anywhere except for my sister. And I left on a counter Lawrence's information on the counter in case I disappeared. Because you don't know when you go away with a man. You don't know if he's going to bring you back. Right. You left a, a, a note to him to keep an eye on the house. I did. You were going. Did you tell him where you were going? No. 
Did you tell me you're going with a man? No. You said, I'm out of here. I said, I'm going to wait. I'm going to go away for a while. Please watch the house. I'll be back. I, I might have even put that I'll be back the following weekend or something. Yeah. And then on the other counter, I left all Lawrence's contact information, the color of his truck, his driver's license, <laughs> in case, you know, his, his website, you know, in case I disappeared. And I told my sister, I said, I'm going to go away. And I said, there's information on the counter if I don't come so back. So you just wanted to, you, that wasn't some... really safety, but just, you just wanted to know who to electrocute if, right. if you didn't come back. Right, if I right. didn't come back home. Okay, right. who to catch and kill. Who to come look for. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um... Now, is it my understanding, um, you know, there's no country song that says, how can I miss you if you won't leave? Um, she left. She, she did. She took up with another man. She did. And instantly, your midlife crisis was over. <laughs> you texted Lawrence and told him to back off. I love this woman more now than ever. How can she know that it's not gonna happen again next month or next year. Danny says when he found out Judy was on a weekend long date with another man, he suddenly, in his words, in an instant, wanted Judy back. Now here's an excerpt from a note that he wrote to her to try to get her back. He said, quote, my tornado has stopped. The trigger, <laughs> was you might be with someone else, and that made me realize how much I love you. I am more in love with you now. I was never going to divorce you. That's why I never took any more furniture. I was just being an <laughs> with my temper, but it is all gone. I will get you anything. Rings, cars, or we can travel anywhere. I have made one mistake in 33 years. I think I deserve a second chance. We're humans, not machines. We can start with counseling again. And you texted Lawrence and told him to back off. Uh, at that very weekend, the, the same weekend she went away, I told him that, uh, yes, I did, the number was on the counter. I did text him and, and I asked him uh, to, as man to man, please back off. Let me, let me try and fix my marriage. We, we have a daughter, grandchildren. Did you know that he got a text? Yes, Lawrence told me that he had texted Danny and he wanted to know how then he got the text number. Because if I did not give it to him, that he was, you know, he didn't really like that. But he, he did tell Danny that um, Danny is the one that brought the evil into the marriage and that he wasn't going to walk away unless I told him to. Mm -hmm. He had no intentions of giving in to Danny. Um, so now you are completely clear on what you want to do. Absolutely. You, you want your marriage back together. Your, your relationship back together, you want your wife back, you want to get back to this unreal life that you had before. I, yes, I am 10 times more appreciative of what I had or maybe still have than ever before. I, uh, I love this woman more now than ever, uh, even after 33 years being together. My love is probably 10 times stronger, uh, obviously, because I've been waiting and putting, I mean, just, just waiting for her to maybe, I never know when the next day she might wake up and say, I want to fix things with my husband again. So I, I, I'm more appreciative of my life, my wife, my beautiful family. Yeah, but and since you don't have any insight into why you just woke up and turned into a monster or whatever. No. Iceman. Uh, Iceman, monster, got stupid, uh, whatever my, we call my, it. My brother has a, has a version of it. He's, he's, a, he's a Christian man. He says maybe the devil's tried to divert you because of you coming closer to Christ. And I, and I can't, he's my brother and I can't ignore what he's saying. Well, no, but I don't think the devil made me do it. it's going to get you. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that's what happened. That's his, that's his version no, of what and, he and thinks. I don't, and listen, I'm very much a Christian and I, I don't make light of of any of that at all, but I also, you know what foxhole Christians are, right? Yes. Yeah, foxhole Christians, are, it's like two guys in a foxhole and the shells are coming in. Mm. He says, are you a Christian? His buddy says, well, I am tonight. There's no, athe uh, no atheist in a foxhole. Yeah, there, exactly. Yeah. But since you don't have insight into why this happened to begin with, how can she know that it's not going to happen again next month or next year? Because it seems, you know, it's kind of, and I don't mean to, this is not an insult to you, it's just, please, but 
it, you see this, if, if there's a dog in the backyard and they've got a toy or a bone over there, mm -hmm. it can lay there forever and the dog not have any interest into it. But you let another dog walk in that gate and walk over to that toy or bone and you got you a dog fight going on because the, the dog wasn't interested in the toy or the bone till another dog was, then all of a sudden he wants to repossess it, he wants to reown it. But then as soon as he does, then it loses its interest to him again. And that, she's got to be thinking here, okay, so he instantly wanted me back when somebody else showed an interest in me, but he sure didn't for months before that. So now well, he repossesses me, the other dog walks out of the yard, and then I'm just over there again I, like the forgotten toy. I understand her. That's got to be part of your her. concern because you're, you're saying, is. am I going to walk it away is. from Lawrence right. and back Why to Why would him? I give up a good thing and go back to something that almost destroyed me? Why would I give him that? Well, I'm going to answer that. Next, Judy says she can't choose between her husband, Danny, and her boyfriend, Lawrence. Danny, 33 years history. Lawrence buckled her knees. <laughs> she wants to make a decision and says, whatever I say goes. I don't want that responsibility, but I am going to give them some things to think about. We'll be right back. I'm in this situation now where I have my husband pulling on me, wanting me to come back to him, and then I have Lawrence, on the other hand, that wants to spend the rest of his life with me. A couple months ago, I moved back into our home. We decided to try and fix our marriage. Everything was like normal. During those four days, it was like a honeymoon again. We were intimate every day. And then uh, four days later, she said she wasn't ready to do it yet. As long as I have those visions in my head of that other woman, I can't fix this. She still angry for what I had done and also had feelings for another person. So I continued living there, sleeping in another bedroom. She would continue to see him. Bringing Danny back into the home has really impaired my relationship with Lawrence. I don't let Lawrence pick me up at my house. If I go away with Lawrence, I meet him somewhere. You have to be respectful. Well, comment on that. Uh... That, that's very painful to, to stay at home and watch that happen. Um, but He's been I, tortured since I let him move back in to see that I'm still living my life one but, day at a time. But I have a, I have but a memory. You say it's respectful to go meet it's, your boyfriend down the street. Well, I, it, the way I look at this is Danny dissolved my marriage vows. I have a marriage certificate. I don't have a marriage. He dissolved the vows that we took before God, and he dissolved them with his actions. So I don't have a marriage. I have a marriage certificate that holds me legally bound to him and all our assets together. But as for Lawrence coming and picking me up, I didn't want to disrespect Danny or hurt Danny. Danny is being tortured ever since he moved back into the house to see that Judy is up functioning, living her life, and moving on one day at a time. Judy can't take a week at a time, but Judy can do one day at a time. And as for Lawrence, Lawrence is willing to accept one day at a time. You know, he knows that there might not be a tomorrow for him. He wants me to be happy, and he wants me to be in my happy place. Danny did not care if I had a happy place. And for him to want me back now, how do I trust that? I don't know how to trust that. But I'm like thinking like you were just saying. The dog didn't want the bone, and then the dog wants the bone now because another dog wanted the bone. You know, so... I knew you'd get it. I got it. I got, I got it. I but the it. thing is, Lawrence doesn't want to give up his bone now. He's not willing to do that. And neither does Danny. So, you know... Well, Judy says she's having a tough time choosing between her husband of 31 years and her new boyfriend of three months. A man who Judy says is like a drug to her. When I'm with Lawrence on the weekends, I'm in my happy place. And then as time goes by and I have to get ready to go back home, I have to go back to reality. And I have to fight again with my emotions. Danny is the Danny that I have known for 33 years. Do I trust him? Absolutely not. And that's what I'm having a hard time with here. How do you trust someone that walked in one afternoon and just walked away from it all and then wants to come back like nothing has happened here? 
Lawrence makes me happy. I had the opportunity to stay with Lawrence. I would stay with Lawrence. But the reality of it is, Danny and I have our assets, we have our family, and there's a lot to be worked out. And I don't know if I'm strong enough to go through all that. Lawrence wants me to be happy. He thinks I need a break from everything. And he offered me to come be with him, and he would pay me my salary for three months, take a mental vacation from everything. I'm in this situation now where I have my husband pulling on me, wanting me to come back to him, and then I have Lawrence on the other hand that wants to spend the rest of his life with me. I can't decide which way to go because either way I go, somebody's going to be hurt and nobody needs to be hurt. Okay. Now, look, here, here's where we are on, on this. Um, this, do you count your history with him of 30 years and your family and all the things that you talked about treasuring so much? Does that have a value? Does that have a valence? Does that have a weight to you? Absolutely, it does. I love my husband. You, you love your husband. I've always loved my husband. And you've got a history with your husband. I do. But then on the other hand, there's Lawrence, and it's fresh and it's exciting. It is. And it makes you feel valued and wanted and, and kind of re-energized your self-worth which had been seriously damaged. That's right. But there's a big difference between falling in love and being in love. Falling in love is it's like skydiving. You're fun, it's fun, it's exciting, it's exhilarating. Being in love is like landing and not killing yourself. I mean, there's, <laughs> there, there's a difference between the two. Yeah, but I didn't plan to fall in love with him. No, I wasn't I'm not saying. I, he pushed you out of the plane, I get that. But, yeah, he, you know, he... He's telling me that he's never loved, he's 57 years old, and he's never loved a woman the way he's loved me. But I'm at the point where now, you know, I don't know if I want to be married ever again. It's time for me to tell you what I think. Thank you. Can I say something? No. <laughs> the odds are against you here, you and Lawrence. I mean, I'm not saying he's not fun to go to the lake with. Right. Lake Lawrence is right. probably <laughs> a lot of fun. But at home, Lawrence... She's mentioned his flaws already. All of that. Well, I mean, a woman is a piece of glass, you know, and you got to remember, you got to keep those edges polished. You have to, you know, you just... you got to take tan. care of her. You, you have Absolutely. to, you know, make her feel like a woman. Lawrence Absolutely. said that? He, no, I told him. Oh, you told him. Okay. <laughs> Right. Well, the thing is, right now, when you look at, at at your husband, you see this other woman. I do. I when see you look her. at Lawrence, you, Lawrence, you see Lawrence. I see Lawrence. At the lake, hair blowing yeah. in the wind. Yeah. He's handsome. All that. Right. <laughs> look at him. He is handsome. Yeah. yeah he's, 57 he's, uh, years old. Yeah. He's, he's, he's handsome. I'm sure Danny I mean, he's provided, he's, he's, uh, he's offered me a life, a life that... I never wanted. As a boy got some money, it means Well, he, he can he can provide me financial security. No he I mean he wants me to be happy. What you know is what Lawrence has told you. Lawrence Lawrence from the beginning took me to meet his very closest friends because he wanted me to know who he was. Right. And he has well, that's helpful. He has. I mean and but he was upset because I kept him in the closet. I wouldn't bring him around my family. But my daughter is not gonna allow another man to be in her children's life. It's yeah. Mimi or Pap. No. And that's it weighing is. heavy on me. It is. It is weighing heavy on me, you know, well, all that. All right, I, it's time for me to tell you what I think. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I say something? No. <laughs> I just, I, I, she, she, she was there for me when I mentally, she was there for me during my mental separation from her. And now I, I, I am there for her. I am her husband, and, uh, and I'm just going to be, be there for her. I have an unconditional love for this woman. She's doing what she feels like she is, 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 has the right to do right now. And is it painful? Yes, absolutely. But I cannot give up on this woman. Yeah. You a hound dog? Um, what's the definition of that? Well, you <laughs> skirt chaser? I Abs mean, you, you're going not. after another woman sometime? I mean, absolutely these are the not. things that she has to weigh in her mind. I understand that. He wouldn't even look at women because he knows I'd bop him upside the head. That's disrespectful. I have, I that have is tried disrespectful. to be done. 
Well, only in a, a moment of rage, I lost myself when I found out that he was with that woman and all those nasty text messages. And you boxed his ears. I busted him up pretty good. I, I tried, didn't think I could ever do that. I've tried Dr. to be the Phil, best. He took me to a place I never want to go again. Okay, well. A woman doesn't act like that. No. You are still hugely pissed. If you want to be happy and at peace this time next year, then you will make the investment of doing what I'm going to ask you to do. <laughs> Would y'all like to hear what I think about this? I do. That's why I'm here. You know I have to go to court Monday. That's why we're here. <laughs> so we're down to the wire here. We are. I have to fly back to West Virginia today, and I have to contact my attorney by Friday. You have unfinished emotional business with him. I do. You are still hugely pissed. I'm hugely pissed, and I'm... Uh, you know, Dr. Phil, here's the thing. I've loved this man with all my heart. Sexually attracted to him after 33 years, can't get enough. You know, I'm sorry. No, I, I, I'm I get sorry. It. I get it. Look, here's the thing. You, Lawrence, charming, fun, high risk guy, though, right? You recognize the high right. risk? I'm right. telling you, high risk. Okay, here you have unfinished emotional business. And I always tell people there is a time to get a divorce. And you know when that time is. The time is when you can walk out that door and say, I have turned over every stone. I have investigated every possible avenue of rehabilitation. I have no unfinished emotional business with this person. If you walk out mad, sad, you know, whatever, in, in some emotional deflected area, then you're not ready to get a divorce. If you want to be happy and at peace this time next year, then you will make the investment of doing what I'm going to ask you to do. Give me 90 days to arrange some very specialized help for the two of y'all to work through where you are right now. If Lawrence is for real, he will step back and respect that, and he'll be standing there on the 91st day. If you go with Lawrence right now, you will spend the rest of your life wondering what it is that caused you to walk away from a 30-year family. Your daughter, the grandchildren, right. that, all of the things that, that y'all created together. And I, I, it's going to have to involve forgiving him. That doesn't mean you will forget it, but you will have to forgive it. And forgiving is a choice. It's not, right. it's not a feeling that comes over you one day, right. like a midlife crisis. <laughs> It's something that you choose to do, you choose to own, and it really has nothing to do with him. It has to do with you saying, right. you know, let God judge that, but I'm not going to be held in that emotional bond for the rest of my life I'm tormented, of yeah. bitterness. You've got to be willing to let that go. And you, there may be some things, you, you may need a pound of flesh before you do that. There may be some things you need to work out. And I will arrange some very, just as our gift to y'all, I will arrange Thank some you. very specialized help to do this. Give me 90 days, or if, you, or if it's 60 days, whatever the intensity is, but I need a period of time for you to finish this business and then look at him where you don't see that other woman. You see the man that you spent 33 years with that got dinner ready for you so you could watch me. <laughs> okay? If I arrange this for you, and I mean, I will start it right now. I mean, by the time y'all get back, well, you're in the air. This will be getting worked on for, for you to get this help it. and move forward. Will you give us that I time? Do. Now, there's a kicker. No Lawrence during that time. Okay. No Lawrence during that time. You've got to right say. Now, starting right now. You, can't, you can talk to him. You can talk to him and tell him what you're going to do okay. and ask him to respect that period. But you can't, you never solve problems in a marriage by turning away from your partner. And you never solve them by bringing in a third party. Okay. Okay, so will you do that? I will. I will. Fair enough? I will. Thank you. Okay, fair enough? Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Okay. That's why I was telling you. Yeah. All right, so we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.
Today on Dr. Phil, a marriage based on lies. He's been pretending to work for the past five years. All the jobs were a complete lie. He would tell you, I'm going to work. He would get in the van and sleep. When you had a house fire, was he helping you dig out of that, or did he race off to this pretend job? Is he ready to face the truth? I didn't know how I was going to come clean. You are lying to me right now. Either tell me the truth or shut up. Let's do it. Why don't we stop all the drama, stop all the fighting, and let's go get you better. Here we go. Have a good show, everybody. If I can help get this family back on track, are you willing to do that? Ready, three, take it. This is going to be a changing day in your life. All right, this is Mike and Kim. They seem like a happy couple. Mike looks like a nice guy. He served in the military, coached Little League, and was on the school board. So most would believe him when he says he worked for major league baseball teams like the Cubs, Texas Rangers, and even the Chicago White Sox. But did he? Well, nope, he didn't. It was all a big lie. He was actually spending his days sleeping in the car. And what is even more perplexing, his wife of 16 years says she had no clue. I have lied to my wife so much I can't remember what I lied about. He's been pretending to go to work for the past five years. I was playing solitaire. After leaving the Air Force, I did feel pressure to land a great job. The first job Mike lied about was the government contracting job in Germany. Mike had me quit my job of about 18 years and had me get a passport. We were supposed to move to Germany. And it was all a lie. After the contracting job, then he supposedly got a job with the Chicago Cubs. I did get a job with a subsidiary of the Chicago Cubs, and I did inflate my resume. Got let go for gross incompetence and not knowing my job. The Cubs care job is really the only job I ever had. All the jobs after that were a complete lie. They were made up. He said that he was hired by Bud Selig of Major League Baseball. When paychecks were supposed to be coming in and they weren't coming in, that's when I would pretty much say, hey, you know what, I've been let go. Then he told me he was working for the Texas Rangers. I told Kim that my job was mostly telecommuting and then I was able to work from our basement office. When he was supposedly going to work, I guess he was in his car hanging out. When I told Kim that I had to be out of town, I would have a pillow, I'd have a cooler, and I would just, I would literally, I'd unroll the sleeping bag, sleep back here. It was trying to remember what I said, trying to figure out where I'm going next. It, it was horrible. His lies were completely young, deliberate and destructive. I don't know why Kim didn't catch on sooner. I'm really surprised that it lasted as long as it did. Okay, even though Mike spun a web of lies, Kim says, well, she says she just did not catch on. When Mike started lying about his jobs was right around the time that I lost our son, Jack, at 20 weeks. Kim went into a deep depression. I spent two years crying every night. That's when I needed him the most. And I thought I could count on him to take care of things. I don't want to say it was easy, you know, to do what I did, but, you know, because she was so detached and I took advantage and I started lying. After the tragedy of our miscarriage, we had a house fire approximately three months afterwards. And then approximately a year and a half almost, we had another house fire. I was so busy dealing with tragedy after tragedy. Why should I have to worry about his job? I never had to check up on his jobs before. It was easy to pull the wool over Kim's eyes. I shouldn't have, but I did, and I just kept lying. Okay, um, I don't really know where to start. I, I kind of want to ask you why you were telling all these lies, but I don't really care. I, it, it doesn't really matter. Does it matter to you? Um, yeah, because I, I, I just don't understand. But, I mean, why do you care? Do, I mean, does it really matter? Is that just going to change your victim story? I mean, seriously, what's, what's it, what does it matter? Is it going to change what you say to yourself about it? Or 
Is it going to make it? Is there anything he can say that makes it okay? No. So why does it really matter? Do we really want to spend time talking about why he did it? No. I mean, listen, I'm very pragmatic, okay? So I'm just really wondering, do you really want to know why? If you do, we can ask him, and I'm sure he'll have some... He'll just lie about it. I mean, no, he'll have some explanation, okay. genuine or, or not. I mean, he'll have some explanation for it. I mean, do you really want to know why? I'll ask him. No. Are you past that? I mean, do you want to say why? I... I... I wish I could say I knew why. Um, no, no, hold on. I, Listen, before sure. you start, I, I got a <laughs> meter that is so sensitive. Yes. I, I do. Listen, I, sure. I got a meter that, I mean, it, just, it, it, it is so sensitive. You just breathe on it. It pegs. Okay. Yeah. And I, I just think that I, I, I deal with con men mm -hmm. day in and day out. I have written a book about this called Life Code. New rules for winning in the real world. I mean, I wrote a whole book about you. Okay. Seriously, and about you, how, what you got to do to win and everybody else in this real world. And part of it is spotting people like this that exploit other people. They have no empathy. They have no remorse. They have no guilt. They're self-destructive. They thrive on drama. They just don't care. They just jerk other people around. And then it deals with what you have to do, whether you encounter them or whether you don't, what you have to do to win in your life for you and those you love. I mean, it's a life code. And I mean, I've written a whole book about this. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sensitized to you. So if you're going to talk to me, you need to really think about what you say first, or this could be a really short conversation. Absolutely. So think about what you say before you say it. It's not that I don't care for her. It's not that I don't love her, okay? When I started lying, it, it, I don't know, it, it's, 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 like, it's like it just came out naturally. It just, it just happened. It just, I don't believe it you. I, that is well, not natural. That is a crock. You got her to quit her job and told her you were moving to Germany. I did. I did. There's Don't tell absolutely... me that's natural. That's not natural. You are lying to me right now. Maybe you're lying to yourself. Either tell me the truth or shut up. And lying to our son. Come on. Listen, th listen, this is a threshold moment in your life. You have finally met somebody that is going to require you to tell yourself the truth, tell me the truth, and tell her the truth. Now, you can go talk to a therapist and they'll say, okay, how does that make you feel? Mm-hmm. And how does that make you feel? Uh-huh. Come back next week and tell me how that makes you feel. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Or you could just meet some old country boy from Texas that's going to just tell you that's a load of crap. That's a load of crap. You did not just one day, you did not just one day open your mouth and just, bleh, I, we're moving to Germany, quit your job. Now, come on. What the hell is going on? I think when I started lying and continued to lie, I don't know if I didn't think... I actually was capable, worthy of... I, of what she thought I could be, what she thinks I could be. Kim is my number one cheerleader. She always has been. She has always been there for me. Um, I don't know if I was my own cheerleader. Did I, did I abuse everything? Absolutely. Um, did I lie? Uh, in the worst way. Um, I don't know, maybe I, I, I just wanted things to look better. Um, I, I, I don't know. Somebody doesn't just start lying like that, right? I mean, he's had to have lied his whole life. You can't just, you don't just start that. Uh, have you come clean with her now? Yes, sir. About everything? I believe so, no. yeah. Huh? I said I believe so, yeah. Okay, no. so there's, there's, not, there's, not, there's nothing outstanding right now. You've told her everything. No. D there's... D there's five years worth of lying in there. Um, I'm sure there's something in there that hasn't, hasn't come to light.
Well, I'm talking about major things. I'm not talking about whether you went to the store and actually you didn't. Major things, yes. You, you've come clean on everything? Yes, sir. You've told her everything. Do you have a college degree? That's not an essay question. I want to take a look at the lies that Mike has told Kim about his work when, in fact, he never had a single job. Okay, March 09, you said you got a job with KBR, Global Engineering, it's a contracting firm yes. in Germany, right? Well, they're out of Houston, Texas. Yeah, well, you, you were moving to Germany. Yes, sir. Okay, and you had a job, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. and, and he wanted you to quit that job. I had to quit to move overseas, yes. Right, and did you? Yes. Okay, so you had a paying job. Mm-hmm. That was bringing in money. Yep. Supporting the family. Yes. And you didn't have a job. No, sir, I did not. Okay, so you had her quit the only job the family had to prepare to move to a job you didn't have. A fictitious job, yes. Okay, now tell me again how this was all because she was your cheerleader. You, you, you <sighs> wanted her to believe in you, so you're going to inflate yourself to the point that you have her quit the only job the family has in support of a job you didn't have, right? Yes, yes. That, that, that's true. Okay, so you're so egomaniacal that you want her supporting your fictitious job at the expense of the only job your family had. That is correct. Um, I, and, and you, I, 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 okay. I know, that's... February 10, you got it, you said you got a job with the Chicago Cubs. Yes, sir. Did not. No, sir. Uh, March 10, no paycheck from the Cubs because there was a mix-up at work. Correct. All right, May 10, you got two promotions with the Cubs. Fictitious. No, no, no job, so you can't get a promotion. Correct. So you got promotions at a job you didn't have. July 10, fired from the Cubs. But after some time unemployed, you do get a job in November 10 with Major League Baseball in New York. Fictitious. Didn't yes. exist. Correct. Okay. December 10, you're fired from Major League Baseball office because you had a conflict with Bud Selig. Correct. Fictitious. The commissioner correct. of baseball, you and him had a conflict. Uh, uh, yes, fictitious, but correct. Right. That's what I said. Yeah, because you couldn't get along with the commissioner of baseball. That's not what you told me, but it doesn't matter. February 11, you got a job with the Texas Rangers. Fictitious. Fictitious. Okay. August 11th, you're fired from your fictitious job with the Rangers. Correct. And August 11th, you're hired again by the Rangers. Apparently Correct. resolved your fictitious differences with yes. your fictitious job, and you go back to the work with the Rangers. So December 11, Kim prepares the family to move to Texas for the job that you had with the Rangers, and then right before the move, you say, oh, we're fired. I lost my job. Correct. Because you can't go down there because you don't have I a job. don't have a job. But in February of last year, Last minute, you got a job with the White Sox. That is correct. Fictitious. Fictitious. So no job. Correct. Okay, now th those weren't the only lies he was telling you though, right? No, yeah. His other lies, you said you got a six-figure settlement that from your right. lawsuit against the Cubs. And that was fictitious. But you didn't have a lawsuit with the we Cubs no because you didn't have a job. a job with the Cubs, so you had no settlement from the Cubs. You said you got a VA grant but you never received the grant. Correct. Said you had an offer on a million dollar house, but you lost the deal years ago. Yes. IRS froze your bank account, but you had no bank account. Correct. So they had nothing to freeze. The house had been in foreclosure for a year and a half. That is correct. But you never told Kim that. That is correct. Okay. Um, you've told her everything. Do you have a college degree? That's not an essay question. No. You don't have a college degree. No, sir. But you've told her you have a college degree. I have. He's got no college degree. I figured. He hadn't told you that until no. today. No, right. So that's... I kept asking him. Because yeah, you just told me you've told her everything, but until right this moment, you've never told her you didn't have a college degree. That is correct. Why did five minutes ago you said, yes, I've told her everything? I said, everything major. Not did you go to the store or not, everything major. You said yes, everything major, except uh, there's one. You didn't tell her you didn't have a college degree. 
I don't know. It, it, it's. Were you just going to leave very, that one out? If it, I guess so. Um, I mean, this is very hard for me to come forward right now. Um, it's, it's, it's. Well, you it's picked liberating. the hell of a place to not come forward. <laughs> Are you like stupid, Miss Gullible? I didn't think I was. I thought I was, you know, a good judge of character. I thought I could spot liars, and. Um, so, uh, you know, I get the feeling I'm more upset about this than you are. No, I, I'm very upset about it. I'm, I can't even wrap my head around the fact that 17 years of my life was a lie. I mean, I, was, I, I don't know how I could be so wrong about somebody. I don't know how that's possible. What do you think when you look at him? I don't even know him. I... This is the man that you walked down the aisle with. This is the man you've crawled in bed with. This is the man you had children with. This is the man you planned your future with. And everything he has told you for all of these years, he would tell you, I'm going to work. He would get in the back of the van and sleep. He'd say, I'm going to New York. He'd go to Chicago and sit on a bench. Yeah, I mean, everybody thought we had a great marriage. I thought we had a great marriage. Um... And I was in love with him. We renewed our vows every year. So I, I don't know how, I, I don't know how that's possible that I can't see. You know, I've been beating myself up about it. I'm really hard on myself, as it is. And I don't know how I could um, not see this. I mean, it feels stupid. Just, I mean, it's. The, how somebody could say they love you and uh, lie to you like that. And our son, who's like the best kid, he did, you don't deserve him. I don't. What's he think about this? Um, well, he said, he said that he thinks of him as an empty shell. And he, I just talked to him Sunday, and he said, I asked him what he thought of his father, and he said he doesn't think of him as his father anymore. He thinks of him as just this guy. He thought he had the best father in the world, and uh, it was completely different. He's having a hard time with it. Do you ever see a paycheck? Did you ever ask to see a paycheck? No. She did Just, ask to see paychecks. I don't remember that, but... I just danced my way around it. Did you ever notice there wasn't any money? Well, I wasn't working, so I wasn't going to the bank that much. I was really... I mean... I don't really spend a lot of money. I don't go out. We don't... Everything's pretty much online. Well, did you ever look like in the, the sock and it was empty? <laughs> no, I mean, I completely trusted him, and I just, everything's done online, and, you know, our banking and our bills, and... I what mean, I saw him did... paying bills sometimes online, and I wasn't getting any notices. I didn't get any phone calls on past due. He... I think he changed the numbers on things, because I didn't get any phone calls on my credit cards. How did you think this was going to end? I, I just, I, I knew it was going to end horribly. Um, I, I, just, I just didn't know when it was going to end. I didn't know how I was going to come clean on it. I didn't know. When you didn't come clean, when, I, when I, she I started asking, did. you lied some more, right? I did. Mm -hmm. I just kept adding on to it. I kept, I just kept piling it on. I would come up with elaborate stories. I would, I mean, you So know, what do you want to do now? I want to be clean. I want to, I want her, I want my wife, I want Kim to, to be in love with the same person that she met 17 years ago. To this that point. person doesn't exist. I was in love with something that didn't exist. I mean, he's not that person, right? I mean, you're not that person. I don't, I, it's never, I, we're never getting, we'll never be together again. 
Well, let's take a break here. When we come back, we're going to talk about how Kim can stop being victimized and start being victim wise. Brad back. After all the lies came out and we were going through our bills, Kim got so frustrated with me, he choked me. I did choke him because I wanted to punch him, but he's got an 18-inch neck, so I knew I wouldn't hurt him. I, I, I did deserve it. I deserve more. Mike told very elaborate lies. He kept his phone on vibrate all the time, and he would answer the phone and have complete conversations that sounded real. He had made up stories of friends that he didn't have. He had some guy die. Mike was a phenomenal liar. Well, that was about how far Mike would go to cover up his lies, but he says he could not stop, and his surprise Kim didn't catch on sooner. The entire time my husband was working in the basement in his office, I thought things were weird. Working from home as much as he did, he would answer the cell phone, but it never was on. It never rang. My sister doubted him and called Major League Baseball, and they were told that no Mike worked there. In retrospect, I think there were warning signs. Okay, um, I, I, I want to talk to you guys kind of individually. Kim was de deceived by her husband, Mike, for years. And it is time for her to stop allowing him to exploit her. Now, I'm going to tell her how. And I've written it all down in my new book called Life Code, The New Rules for Winning in the Real World. So I'm going to tell Kim how to finally win big in her life and stop being victimized and start being victim wise. And there is a big difference between being victimized and being victim wise. And I'm going to tell you what I think you need to do. And then I'm going to tell you what I think you need to do. And you're going to be surprised that I have more belief in you than you probably have in yourself. And I'm going to tell you why I do. I'm surprised by that. In a minute. Okay, listen. I don't know what's going to happen between you two. I, I, I don't. That's going to be a decision that you have to make. But let me tell you, when I, I kind of wrote Life Code in two parts, um, and it was interesting. I, I, I wrote Life Code with my son, Jay. He kind of worked on this book with me because he has a publishing company called Bird Street Books, and he actually published uh, this book. And um, I, I wrote it because my kids were born into a very different world than I was born into. This world is changing, and the challenges are changing. And if you want to be a winner in your life, if you want to land on your feet after all this, there are certain things you have to do, and you're going to have to lead your son through this. I mean, he's, this has shaken him to the core, has it not? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so he's now looking at you saying, Mom, what's up here? And see, I think you made a fundamental error that all of us were taught. And one of them is, is that we give people the benefit of the doubt, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's the thing you do. You just you, you, you look for the good in people, and you give people the benefit of the doubt. I think that is a big mistake, particularly in this day and time. Why do that? Why give people the benefit of the doubt? Because it sounds like the right thing to do? That, to me, is crazy. I don't think it was ever right. But it's certainly crazy now, in this day and time. Why give people benefit of the doubt? Why not? say, let's just keep an open mind and collect data. I talk in Life Code about the Sweet 16. There are 16 things that every winner I've ever studied in my life, and I've been studying them since I was 12 years old, there are 16 things those people do. And one of them is they are always in investigatory mode. You were not in investigatory mode. You, sh come on. You, you, you tell me, you looking back, you didn't see warning signs? Come on. 
You well, didn't I, see warning signs always, looking back? I always was that kind of person, I felt like. And then, you know, after oh, the tragedies that aren't happening, I just checked out. I mean, for the last few years, I've been saying to myself that I don't, I don't recognize myself anymore. You couldn't take off work from your pretend job? I, you couldn't get a pretend leave of absence? I, to deal with your not pretend it, it, fire? I, What do you think the frequency is of house fires in America? A lot. It's a lot. No, it's not. No. <laughs> How many families in America you think have two house fires? Well, that's, I know, yeah. And in a year and a half. Yeah. And you now believe he said at least one of them, don't you? I question it, yeah. You question whether or not he set the second house fire. Mm-hmm. Did you? No, sir, I did not. I adamantly will tell you I did not set that house yeah. fire. Well, I don't know whether you believe him or not, but you had two house fires in a year and a half. That is really bad odds, OK? Well, you I had warning it signs. at that second fire, and the firemen made me feel better about it. Yeah, and when you had the second house fire, was he really diving in there and helping you dig out of that, or did he have to race off to his pretend job? He was, yeah, off on his pretend job while me and his brother, his brother and I, I were. was the first, the first one. You the first had to one, race yeah. off to your pretend job. I you did. couldn't take off work? I, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't there, I know. I wasn't there, I wasn't supported. See, his this just doesn't me. add up. You couldn't take off work from your pretend job? I, you couldn't get a pretend leave of absence? I, to deal with your not pretend it, it, fire? I... See, th come on. Look, you, you have to understand. You, looking back, there are things I'm wanting you to do differently. You have to be... You, you can't give people the benefit of the doubt. You have to constantly be in investigatory mode. Winners deal with the truth. Winners deal with the truth. You can't be in denial. You can't have functional blindness. You can't look the other way. Th that's how you become victim-wise instead of victimized. You deal with the truth. You, it's not time to curl up in emotional fetal position. Don't show that to your son. Don't curl up and say, oh, we've been destroyed by this man. We have to get over here and curl up and treat the world as though it's a hurtful place. No, you step up and you deal with the truth. Become stronger from this. Get with your son and you say, look, we have each other here. We have each other. You have to have a defined image. Winners have a defined image. They decide who they are. And you're going to decide that you're either going to be a broken, betrayed victim who has lost all confidence because you didn't see what was happening to you, or you are going to say, as expensive as it was, this was tuition. I paid for an education here, and my image is I am a stronger woman for it. I will lead myself. I will lead my son. I will not be broken by this. I will stand strong, and I will walk out of my history. Go to school on this. Be stronger for this. Don't be broken by this. Be stronger by this. I feel like I've tried to get help along the way, and it just hasn't worked out, and it just feels like it's piling on more and more. And, uh... What do you hear me telling you? I know, it's just, it's hard. I don't, I, I'm hard on myself. I feel like stupid. I feel like, you know, I'm going to be judged and I'm an idiot and I didn't see this. And I feel bad I did that to my son, really. I mean, okay. I'm responsible for him. And you can have that internal dialogue or you can do what I'm saying. You can do what you're saying and be a victim. It's not or you easy. can do what I'm saying and be a leader. Well, I want to. It's just, it's very hard. It's... I'm trying. I, yeah. I but want to. But you can do it. You can do it. You've got to decide. I'm either going to be a victim that's broken by this, 
or I am going to stand strong and I'm going to say, boy, did I go to school on this. I have learned my lesson. Never again will I bury my head in the sand. Never again will I not be in investigatory mode. Never again will I allow someone to lead me blindly down the path. Never again will that happen. This was expensive, but boy, did I get an education. I got a PhD. I got a black belt in life right here. And I am going to use it going forward. Well, it's just, you know, it's like, where do you start? Because it's I'm like, to, are you I've kidding just... me? Am I not? Is this not on? <laughs> What the hell were you thinking? <laughs> well, would you rather me wait six months and then talk to you? Because you can. No. Because you can feel sorry for yourself for six months. No, I don't want to feel no, sorry. No, you can. You can feel sorry for yourself for six months. I don't want to feel sorry for myself. I really don't. Because you deserve to, honestly. You can go curl up for six months, but I'd rather not. I'd rather you just decide, you know what? By God, I've had enough. I'm walking out of my history. My son and I are going to be better for this. That's what I want you to do. And you know what? I'll get you some help with that. I will get you and your son some help with this so you can implement everything that I'm telling you. I will give you each a copy of Life Code. I will give it to you in an audio book. I will give it to you in an e-book. I will give it to you in a hardback book. I will get you a therapist to read it to you every day. I will do whatever is necessary, but I want you to be better. And I will get you help with this. Will you take that help? Yes. I will get you that help. Because you can be better from this. You are better than that. I don't want you to be the victim here. Okay? Okay. And I know, listen, I get that it's hard, but you can do this. And I don't know what you're going to do with him. Well, he's, we're done, but he's always my son's father, so. Uh, and I know y'all are separated. I don't know how to f I, I know y'all are separated. I don't know how to deal with the, my son's relationship with him. Well, I'm going to talk to him about that right now, okay? And okay. you may support what I'm going to tell him, and you may not, but that's between him and I, he and I. But I'm... I've told you what I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to get you some help with that. But I do want you to read Life Code. I will. And I'm going to give it to you in audio book, too, so you can listen to it when you, in your car, and when you go to sleep at night, and you play it, and you listen to it. It's very inspirational. Okay. You're going to hear me in your head. <laughs> what the hell were you thinking? I wasn't. Yeah, you, you really weren't. No, I wasn't. Listen. I... Um, you, you let, me, let me tell you what happened here, and I'm going to tell you why I'm really going to help you here. Um, you, you got into this, and you, you told one lie, in my opinion, because you were ashamed to tell the truth. You were ashamed to go admit, I can't get a job. And you were proud, and you were ashamed to say that. And then one lie turned into two, and two turned into three, and then at that point it's like, hell, I can't go tell her now, I've been lying. And then pretty soon, you're like a rat in a maze and you can't find your way out. And then you kind of become a slave to the lies. And you keep thinking, I will get a job for real mm -hmm. and then it'll never come out. And then... That's what I was hoping. I can just cover it up and then it'll just go away. But that never came. I, I get it. Stupid, but I get it. Um, and it just got away from you. You made some really bad choices. And I don't know that you can ever repair this with her. Um, you must repair it with your son. Absolutely. Um, and if your son is listening, 
to this. I, I hope he hears me when I tell him that he owes it to you and to himself to forgive his dad and, and, and try to work through this. I, I would love to be able to shake my head and, and walk away from this, but I've got a real soft spot in my heart for the men and women in this country that put on that military uniform and go stand in harm's way for me and my family and everybody else. And that is one thing that I have verified that you did in fact do and do with honor. Yes, sir. And um, for that reason, if no other, I, I am prepared to really step up and help you find your way back because I do thank you for your military service and everything you did for this country because you did so and you did so with honor. And, uh, and I thank you. And, uh, and uh, I am. Uh, and I know sometimes it is hard to come from that situation and so much responsibility and so much leadership, so much contribution to come back here and then you can't even find a job. And that is a tough transition and people react to that in different ways. And uh, I for one think we don't provide enough support and help for that transition. And. Um, that doesn't excuse and explain everything that you've done. Um, but I'm not going to be party to those who don't help our men and women make that transition. That help should have been available to you then. I'm going to make it available to you now. <clears throat> I'm going to help you sort this out. I'm going to help you understand by getting you some professional help the error of your ways, the bad decisions. I am then going to get you some professional help to truly get a genuine, non-inflated resume in place. I am going to get you a professional placement and headhunter uh, in position and I'm going to make every effort to get you a legitimate position with a legitimate organization and get you employed in a proper way with a proper organization so you can hold your head up, look your son in his eye, and have yourself a future where you have a chance to move forward. I just want to be an open book to him. Uh, so we're going to start there. Will you take that help from me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. We'll take that help, and you, you don't object to me helping him in that way? No. And whatever happens with you two will work out as we move forward, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, no expectations, all right? My anyway, priority is Kim and Ben. I have one last question when we come back. Is there anything left that Mike has not told Kim? One last chance for him to come clean when we come back, and then we're done. We'll be right back. Well, I, I'd really like to thank uh, my guest today. It is so important that even within a relationship that you really pay attention to what's going on and that you have open communication at all times. Now, is there anything else, anything else that you've thought of as you're, you're sitting there that you feel like you need to share? No, my mind is in a whirlwind right now. I, I can't think of anything. Okay. I mean, I feel like I've let it all out in the table. Okay. All right, good enough. Um, so we'll, we've got a plan for you, right? And, mm -hmm. and you understand what I'm saying. I, I, I understand this takes the wind out of your sails, but you've got a choice about how you react to it. You can either say, uh, you know, I've never trust anybody again. I'm devastated. I'm just going to curl up. Or you can say, look, I, okay, that happened. I've gone to school on that. It's going to make me stronger, and I'm going uh, I'm going to step out and wiser f for the journey, and I I'm going to play the game differently, but I'm not going to sit on the sidelines. And I, 
That's really what I want you to do. And I know that's easier said than done. That's why I said I'm going to get you some help with it. And I really want you to study, memorize life code. I'm going to wait a week and send you a multiple choice test. Um, <laughs> I am very proud to say that Life Code is published by my son Jay's publishing company, Bird Street Books. It's available in stores everywhere. You can get it at Barnes & Noble and Amazon.com and Costco and Walmart and just everywhere. And you guys don't need to do that because everybody in the audience is going home with a copy. Okay? So you can find it. Thanks for being here. So long. Thanks, guys. Yeah, sure.